Uh, Dr. Kenny, thank you so very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, uh, we'll pick up uh, eventually with uh, the part three of my series, Will Israel Attack Iran? But as usual, I try to give some sort of uh, contemporary comments on issues of the day. And there's really, uh, I guess, about three that I want to touch on. Uh, first of all is the the whole uh, federal government using Verizon, but it's not just Verizon, it's all of the other uh, phone uh, areas to uh, listen in on calls. But then somebody will qualify that and say, well, they're not really listening in. It's no big deal. Uh, Lindsey Graham is uh, poo-pooing those who are concerned about this thing. In order to provide security or catch terrorists, I don't mind a bit if uh, the federal government has my my phone number. But uh, the, the the question really is uh, somewhat different than that, and you have to go sort of a back and forth, pro and con, to to find out where the issue boils down to. And the issue always really comes down to can you trust the government? And the answer seems to be increasingly, well, no, we can't. And it's really not a, a partisan sort of thing. It's not just Obama. I mean, if you look back at the Nixon, Nixon days and their enemies list and so forth, uh, there's enough potential uh, potential problems to go around. And as, as usual, what happens is a precedent may be set, and people will say, uh, the Democratic side, well, uh, President Obama's administration is trustworthy, and then the opponents will say, do you really trust Eric Holder <laughs> to, to be a nonpartisan kind of guy? And we know that uh, e- even in agencies, which are supposed to be nonpartisan, there are certain partisan activities. And so once again, it really comes down to uh, whether can, one can trust the, the government. And so what happens is there's a sort of back and forth, a back and forth, as to, well, uh, they they would give an example. For example, about, about six years ago, and there was a linkage from some terrorist uh, in Pakistan calling somebody, and the, the phone message uh, popped up because uh, the administration now says, well, we don't, we don't link the names with the phone numbers. We just have phone numbers. And so if there's a commonality of a phone number that we know in Pakistan has to do with terrorists, and then two different uh, individuals are contacting somebody at the same phone number in Colorado. Then that gives us a head up, heads up. And then that information can be relayed to the FBI, which then has to go through these rigorous procedures to get a judge to say, okay, now you can find out who the person is and, and go for there in terms of a domestic operation. But again, uh, all of this really boils down to can you trust the government? And so the question really should be, uh, can you trust the government always? The answer, of course, is no. But if they spend it, Dennis, they, they don't really go by this, Judge. This is all <laughs> smoke and mirrors, basically. They've been tapping all of our telephone calls. It may not be the FBI, but it's NSA. And it's not really NSA. It's the British intelligence. Right. The British intelligence taps all of our phone calls. We tap all of the British and European phone calls. That way, NSA can go before Congress and say, we wouldn't tap the telephones because it's illegal. They know the British are doing it and we're doing it to them. But th- these people lie. They lie consistently. And I think everybody should be concerned. Why are they lying? Because they don't want the American people to know we're moving towards a dictatorship. And they have extensive dossiers on everybody listening to this program this afternoon. Our telephone number is one trip. Well, we're not going to open the lines just yet. We want to hear what Dr. Cuddy has to say right here at Radio Liberty. Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty. We're talking with Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who, of course, has taught at the university level, who's been a consultant for industry, who was in the Reagan Department of Education for many years. And Dr. Cuddy's that they talking about this whole scam that they're putting over why uh, certainly the FBI is not collecting information from telephone calls. All they want are the telephone numbers. And if they know somebody uh, suddenly is a terrorist and a lot of people calling that number, then of course, they can track it down. And ladies and gentlemen, it's all a lie. They know certainly the FBI is not tapping your telephone regularly. It's NSA, and it's not NSA. It's British intelligence with a 
with full cooperation of the, of the National Security Agency. We listen to the English and European telephone calls, and the English intelligence listens to our calls. Check it out on the Internet. You'll find it's true. And all of this going back in Washington, D.C., is smoke and mirrors to confuse the public so they really can't figure out what's going on. They used to call it lying. Go right ahead, Dennis. Yeah, and it's uh, the echelon system they basically use. Then you throw into that uh, something else, which I'll get to in a minute. You'll see how, how ridiculous the whole thing is. But in terms of the current debate, the, the ultimate question with all this back and forth is, can you always trust the federal government? The answer is no. And therefore, uh, you then have to uh, say, well, can you link phone numbers with names? And of course, you can. And therefore, the assumption should be, well, if they can, at some point, they will. And so then your concern is uh, legitimate. Now, what would happen, though, is the other side will come back and say, well, let us suppose it's your family and your wife and your children, and uh, is it worth the federal government actually, and this is where they would acknowledge, uh, they, they would say, yes, yes, they are listening in, and yes, they do link the names to the phone number, but isn't that worth it as a matter of security if it was to prevent your wife and your children from being killed? Now, if you put that question out to a lot of people, they would say, they, they might pause. They say, well, golly, you know, uh, if all the federal government wants to do is link a phone number with my name, and that would save my, you know, my wife's and children's lives, gee, you know, maybe I can. There's that, that sort of slippery slope they go through. All right, but then the counter to that is, if you go back to the American Revolution, they could have said the same thing. They could say, well, look, you know, if we revolt against England, the government of the day, uh, we're going to lose a lot of lives. And so would our founding fathers have been better to not have the American Revolution, you know, a Declaration of Independence, knowing for sure that a lot of wives and sons and daughters would be killed? And so you then you start to Hold that thought. Of- hold that thought right there. We'll be- well, this is Dr. Stan and Dr. Cuddy simply are using the arguments that are given by the people who want to justify giving government ever more power over our lives, saying, look, all we want to do is be able, of course, to be able to correlate your names and telephone numbers, and, oh, we may listen once in a while, but wouldn't you really be willing to give up some of your, uh, your individual privacy to save the lives of your wife and children? After all, we're involved in war and terrorism, and you wouldn't want your wife to be killed? And the answer is, I certainly wouldn't want my life to be killed. But we've killed over 80,000 innocent civilians over there in Syria just in the last couple of years. We're funding the terrorists over there. They're lying to you about that. And they really do intend to kill off most of the people in the world. There really is a separate force having nothing to do with our government, but a subversive force behind the scenes. And if you doubt what I'm saying, Please go up on the Internet and type in Population Control Agenda. Population Control Agenda. You can use my name, Stanley Monte, to get it off our website. Population Control Agenda. Read it. Understand there are people who have an entirely different agenda, and they really do intend to kill off most of the people, and they've already killed uh, several billion people so far, presented their births, several billion people so far, and they're going to be killing billions more. Do you really want to give these people access to your intimate thoughts and telephone? conversations. Go right ahead, Dennis. Yeah, and uh, so the comparison then would be back to the founding of the country, that do you want to give the government at that time, the British government, more and more control and authority, or do you want to have a revolution, even though it would mean the loss of your wife, life, your sons, your daughters, and so forth? And that is a, that's a, a real situation that the founders had to, had to ask themselves, was the pursuit of freedom. Uh, and this Declaration of Independence worth the loss of life, even the loss of personal life, even the, the loss of their own life. And, of course, we know what the answer of the founders of the country uh, was. However, the public today is being conditioned uh, through various situations to uh, reassess that and be willing to give up some uh, sacrifice, some of our liberties. And that's one of the questions that they asked right after 9-11, that very afternoon, ABC Washington Post, had a poll, uh, the results of a poll, the results of a poll immediately showing that two-thirds of the public, the American public, would be willing to sacrifice some of our freedoms in order to have security. 
So they do these psychological probes every once in a while. Now, but that's the question: why they can't let the American people know that those were controlled demolition. But they were controlled demolition. Just watch Building 7 come down. It took me two years to convince myself that was controlled demolition. But watch the center of the building, the top of the roof of Building 7, as it caves in first and goes into sort of a mild V. And then they take out the base of the building. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a controlled demolition. Watch Building 7 come down and then understand that they use that to justify taking away our freedom in the name of giving us security. And ladies and gentlemen, they're not interested in our security. They're interested in the dictatorship so that they can eliminate most of the population. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and that, that principle went all through. I mean, it was back in Vietnam where there's a famous quote, we had to destroy the village in order to save it, you know, when, one of those things. And so uh, they, they do this psychological uh, manipulation of the public. And so the, the second level of questions one has to ask about this whole Verizon and the, the government uh, uh, listening in or uh, listening to the phone numbers and where their uh, origin is and who they're going to is uh, what is the worth of this listening in? Uh, I think uh, it's really sort of absurd given that we know that Osama bin Laden, for example, would not use the cell phone because he knew that we were, that, uh, we were monitoring uh, calls already. Now, how did he know this? Well, uh, his family, the Saudi bin Laden group, uh, is in control of one of the uh, 12 satellite relay stations of the, uh, the Iridium uh, complex, as you want to call it. Another one is the Great Wall Corporation over in China. So uh, even Osama bin Laden and his uh, top people knew that uh, if they used a cell phone, it would uh, locate them. Uh, they also knew not just it, this wasn't just an American sort of terrorist in uh, Afghanistan Al Qaeda situation. Uh, we actually aided uh, the uh, the Soviets back when the Soviet Union was to find a quote terrorist against the Soviet Union by, because we intercepted a cell phone call. And we told the Soviets where the guy was, and they dropped a bomb on him, and they killed him. So we helped the Soviets assassinate or kill uh, a person who had been terrorizing the Soviet Union and their citizenry. So it's, it's almost like you have to be in some sort of cave and never you know, listen to any media or anything to not understand that if you're a, quote, terrorist in Pakistan, Afghanistan, wherever, calling anybody – that you have to be an absolute idiot to use a cell phone to communicate. I mean, you, they have to know that their calls are being intercepted. So, so, so that's the second point. What is the worth of this, given that only absolute idiots would be using cell phones to call somebody in the United States from Pakistan, given that you know you, you, they have to, they have to know, unless they're in nincompoop, they have to know that these calls are being monitored. Now, that raises the third level of concern about the whole issue. If all they have to do, the government in general, whatever government, is to have a case where this is useful, then uh, what's to stop sort of a, a an individual government from having its own asset somewhere else, make a call, so that the government can then say, aha, Johnny Terrorist, who's really one of our agents in, you know, wherever it is, uh, Bulgaria <laughs> somewhere, uh, we located, uh, you know, Johnny Terrorist in Bulgaria, and uh, we know that he's a terrorist. Why? Well, because the Bulgarians are saying he is, when actually he may be a, an American asset, CI asset. And lo and behold, Johnny Terrorist is calling uh, these three or four people in uh, Albany, New York, right? And say, aha, now we're going to find out who these people are that Johnny Terrorist is uh, calling, and we go to the federal judge, and looky here, federal judge, you know, these three people and all this. And so the federal judge, you know, usually compliant, I mean, what do they know? You know, you stick some documents in front of them, they say, oh, looks good to me. And so they say, okay, you can link that, that, the names with Johnny Terrorist over in Bulgaria, and then they have a precedent. You know, then, whether that year, the next year, the next year, when somebody comes along and exposes it, ah, look what Verizon has been doing, used for and everybody gets all upset, they can come back and say, hey, but back in, you know, the year 2010, we located Johnny Terrorist over in Bulgaria. So there's all kinds of problems with this whole concept, this whole concept. And so what, what it turns out to be is they set precedents whereby they can further erode our uh, freedoms and our liberties, which is what it's the whole thing's all about anyway. So that's the first thing. 
But that's not all we have to be concerned about. The second thing is uh, the increasing use of drones. Now, uh, most people are under the impression that uh, drones are uh, used overseas in Yemen or wherever to attack uh, various terrorists there. Of course, you know, when they attack the sons of terrorists who are American citizens, they say, well, tough luck, the, the, the kids should have had a better choice of fathers and so on. But the point is, drones are not only used overseas, but they're used here, and then you'll, somebody will say, oh, but they're strictly regulated, you know, the government, only the government has drones. Well, uh, the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, has already, you know, done sort of an anticipation here, and they anticipate uh, that by the year 2020, just seven years from now, there will be 10,000 drones in our domestic sky, 10,000 here. And you'll you'll find uh, individuals on, you know, whether it's the political left or right saying, whoa, wait a minute, what what are they doing? And so the government say, well, we're tracking, tracking, quote, suspected criminal activity, right? Just all you got to do is have a suspicion, right? That's a potential terrorism. I mean, maybe a domestic terrorist, you know, not necessarily uh, al-Qaeda. It could just be a domestic terrorist. And so you're you're going to have this great increase in desire to use these unmanned uh, aircraft and it won't it won't just be used to you know go down the road to track some al- potential Al Qaeda contact. They'll be using this for map making, uh, for mining, uh, agriculture, uh, forestry, scientific research, all kinds of things. Now that means that you're going to actually probably have private providers. Now they'll you know maybe they'll have a contract with the federal government, like uh, it might be a private ag- agency that looks for missing persons, you know, uh, these, these, these hikers are lost somewhere, and you have this private outfit that has this drone, and it goes up there, and it's looking for the poor lost hikers, right? Well, the, the thing about that is you have to anticipate these, the problems that can arise. For example, do you really doubt that the government will, will have the capability to uh, interface with those drones? I mean, the drones are going to be communicating somehow, right? The little drone camera is whizzing along, and it's looking down for the lost hikers or whoever it is, and it's sending a signal back to the the home base, the private provider, whatever. All right, so now as that expands, as it expands for all kinds of uses, all kinds of uses, you know that the government is going to be able to access those relays, those relays back to the home base. Uh, For example, there's this one little police force, in the, uh, the state where I am, it's not, you know, it's not the FBI, it's not the CIA, it's not the NSA, it's this little police force, and they got their own little drone, their little drone. Now, they'll say, well, we're looking, you know, for drugs. You know, we're, we're going over these thick fields, and it's looking down, and it's going to find the marijuana fields and so forth. Well, now, how hard is it for the NSA to access whatever that drone is seeing by that little police force, you know, looking for drugs? And, of course, that, that, little, that little drone might or just come across you instead of the marijuana field. And so the NSA can access the communication of that drone back to its home base when it's looking at you, well, not think, just I, the marijuana field. I think it's important people understand that we have a government and then we have an invisible government. We have a legitimate government. We need a legitimate government. But this has really been taken over by an invisible government that has a different agenda that represents what I call the Brotherhood of Darkness, who Dennis calls them the power of, it doesn't matter what you call them, a small group of people of great wealth and power, demonically motivated, who control the reins of government, and not only in our country, but many governments throughout the world. They're powerful spiritual forces, ladies and gentlemen, powerful spiritual forces. Dennis, go right ahead. Okay, well, that's the second thing. I'll watch for the increased use of drones, and they will become more and more invasive in terms of not just looking uh, for uh, lost hikers or marijuana fields, but <clears throat> they will also be able to track you, and the NSA will uh, be able to interface or intercept uh, the signal. So they're being sent by those drones and the private providers uh, back to their home base. I mean, that's, that's, that will be one way that they will be indirectly able to uh, monitor you. 
I mean, there's there's all kinds of ways. Like I said, there. It, it, it amazes me the dumbness of the American public. The American public, I remember 10, 20 years ago when the internet came along, said, "Oh, okay, now we'll be able to, you know, outmaneuver the the bad power elite." you know, who's uh, controlling our lives, because now we will be able to communicate with anybody anywhere in the world and organize against these powerful people trying to control us. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, I was was thinking, you you, you dummies, don't you understand that this is their way of monitoring what you're doing, your communication? Uh, Back 20 or 30 years ago, they, they may have gone through the difficulty of getting some sort of court order to tap your land based phone. Right? They'd have to go to the judge, okay, we want to tap, you know, John Smith's home base, I mean, land based phone in Detroit or somewhere. Well, when everybody is using cell phones, they don't have to get a federal judge to do anything. They just intercept the satellite signal. I mean, it's as simple as that. They just listen to everything. And like Dr. Stan says, they, they use the echelon system for the British to monitor our calls, and we monitor their, theirs, and, you know, it's all, all around the world. They, they get around that. You know, well, let's say France has a law against it. Okay, so whatever. Maybe, you know, the Germans monitor theirs and they exchange that. Whatever. So they're, they're busy monitoring and uh, keeping track of everybody, their movements, their purchases, uh, their communications, uh, and whatever. Now, of course, uh, in addition to uh, control, which they want, monitor, they know where you are, what you're doing, your control, what you buy, and so on and so on. They, of course, uh, enable, uh, they have to be able to intervene in places. So one raise, way they intervene is by creating crises, uh, like uh, uh, today. Again, there's out in California this shooter on campus. So, so they, they keep going through these or shooters at uh, elementary schools. And so the cries go up, you know, more gun control, more gun control, more monitoring, more monitoring, and so forth and so on. And so uh, one of the things they have to do, because it's a world government they want, is they have to stir up things uh, internationally. All right, so, uh, for example, we were told that uh, the example that we should follow is our wonderful success in Iraq. You know, yes, there were problems, yes, we messed up, but uh, look at what we got. It's, uh, now they have their government, and the Shia and the Sunnis are all just sort of uh, getting along. We've got this huge uh, base there, the largest uh, embassy, quote-unquote, in the world, which is really the largest listening station <laughs> in the world. I mean, you don't need, you know, all of those people in there to uh, issue passports, right? So uh, what they're doing is they're using that as a sort of listening base in a central location between Iran on their east and Syria uh, on their west. Uh, except there's one problem. You know, is if you actually have peace in a country, then you might have the government sort of rethinking this huge American presence. So things must be stirred up. So uh, how do you keep things stirred up in this supposed success land? Well, just a few weeks ago in Basra, uh, which is a predominantly Shiite city, that's you know in South. Hold America. that thought. Hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be back here in just a moment. Here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dennis is uh, pointing out the fact that basically, of course, you only get the people to be willing to give up their freedom by convincing them that they have an enemy that's threatening them and their family. So you, you actually create these enemies, and sometimes you finance them, and sometimes you encourage them. Other times you know what they're doing, and you let them go right ahead and commit terrible acts of violence. And then you say, look at those acts of violence. We've just got to take away everybody's freedom uh, so that that these terrible terrorists, most of whom are funded by the United States and by our intelligence agencies, so these terrible terrorists, you know, cannot uh, harm American citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, we're fighting al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. We're funding al-Qaeda in Egypt and in Tunisia and in Libya and in Syria. So why would we fight, uh, so they fight up? Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and funded every other place. Who's funding the world terrorist movement? We are. Just go up and type in your search engine, CIA funding terrorism or Al-Qaeda, and you'll find that it's entirely true. Of course, our good friends, the Saudis, this ruthless, tyrannical government that cuts off people's hands and feet and stones women to death if they're caught in adultery and castrates men and tortures them and beheads people all the time regularly. They do this every week. 
and yet we're keeping them in power. And we never talk about the atrocities over in Saudi Arabia. Well, they're helping to fund this world terrorist movement, too, in conjunction with our own, what I call the invisible government of the Brotherhood. Dennis, you go right ahead. Yeah, um, what made me suspicious, uh, one of the first things that made me suspicious, I mean, I was always suspicious, but one of the first things that convinced me about uh, Osama bin Laden being right out of central casting was <clears throat> uh, after the 9-11 attack, and they started uh, pointing the finger at Osama bin Laden, you know, here he is. It, it, there's all the usual questions about how could he drag this dialysis machine all over the place. But even if you assume that what he did, he did, and, and so forth, I remember one of his first statements, his first statement issued from his, you know, cave, wherever he was, they relay these messages from, not by cell phone, though, uh, was not what you would expect. For example, if you're a committed uh, anti-Western imperialist uh, who hates the West uh, because of its decadence, and it's the corruption of your, your homeland and so forth, which is what uh, Osama was uh, supposed to be, what he's supposed to be, then when you have a 9-11 or you attack, uh, what you would expect him to say is, we have successfully completed a mission uh, killing the great Satan, uh, the people who support that evil government of George W. Bush and the evil Americans who are you know, a corrupt culture destroying the world and the wonderful uh, Muslim people of uh, my homeland and so forth. And, and we, you know, we have dealt us a horrible blow inflicting uh, death upon, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Because that's what the mullahs and others had been saying when they were here back in the 80s, raising funds in Oklahoma City and all over there. You know, there's the videotape by Steve Emerson, uh, you know, taping these mullahs over here, you know, death to the Americans and blood in the streets and all that. So you would think after the attack, that's what Osama bin Laden would be saying. You know, we have successfully killed the evil America. You know, it's like a war, right? We've killed the enemy, and this is a wonderful thing. But he didn't say that. He didn't say that. One of the first things Osama bin Laden said was, this is going to result in a loss of freedom for you Americans. Now think about that. He's not talking about we're in a war, we're killing our enemy and the Americans. He says this will result in a loss of freedom. Now that told me he wasn't pursuing this as a military operation against the, the great Satan. What it was was he was an agent of the power league because they're the ones who want to use conflict to further erode our freedom. And that's what he knew. Osama bin Laden knew that's what the result would be. Now how would he know that? Because he's not stupid, <laughs> And he's an agent of these guys. Of course he'd do. That's what would happen. Of course he'd have that as one of the main purposes. That's one of his main purposes, to help the paralyte erode our freedom. And let me just point out that source we're told then that uh, Osama bin Laden then was able to live for many years after that with his, uh, with his uh, you know, uh, dialysis machine hiding in caves, hiding all over. And eventually uh, the Americans courageously tracked him down and, and he was killed. Of course, the story keeps changing. We get so many stories about what happened there. Uh, but we do know apparently there was a SEAL Team 6 that was involved. But the interesting thing is the most amazing thing I think the 24 or 25 of those uh, people in that SEAL team are all dead today, including the man who led this, who was exposed by uh, certainly Leon Panetta. They identified him. That man's dead. Most of the SEAL team, is that just a coincidence? Or maybe, maybe they know this whole thing is fraudulent. And the last thing they can let the American people know is that most of what you think or believe just isn't true. Dennis, go right ahead. Yeah, and um, so it's a coincidence that the uh, 26th or whatever members of SEAL Team 6 just happened to be in that Chinook helicopter that was brought down, and the only one in a long time that has been brought down. That, that's a coincidence. Uh, it's just like, uh, and therefore they can't talk, right? They can't be called before Congress to testify. Uh, so similarly, it, could it be another coincidence that Ambassador Stevens in Libya is now deceased, and he can't testify uh, after Congress uh, was going to ask him some questions about gun running from Libya up to Syria. 
See, now he can't testify either, can he? <laughs> Just, oh, it's just another amazing coincidence. Another amazing coincidence. So uh, what we have here is the consternation that stirred up, because what Dr. Sam said, you have to have an enemy. And so what you find in this model that uh, everybody is supposed to be following of our successful uh, nation building in Iraq is uh, back uh, about three weeks ago, May 20th in Basra, which is predominantly a Shiite uh, uh, area of city. In southern Iraq, you, you have this bomb, and it, uh, it you know, just rips through a group of uh, day laborers. Uh, they just gathered, you know, to buy some food, a crowded area, sort of like the Boston Marathon. And uh, what, uh, what you find out is that that was one of two, uh, two in, uh, in Basra, sort of like, you know, two in Boston. Okay, two in Basra. And uh, there was actually a dozen all across Iraq that same day. They killed uh, about almost 100 people, wounded like 250 more. And then the following day, the following day, May 21, this three weeks or so ago, uh, the opposite happened. There were bombs exploded near a, a Sunni mosque, you know, people gathering for religious service. There was a Sunni mosque in uh, western Baghdad. And... Uh, uh, there was also uh, a, a, another uh, group of people killed in Kirkuk, and there was you know, more than 20 or so killed altogether. So you have the first attack against the Shiites, and then the second one against the Sunnis, right? you got to stir up both sides. And so all of this occurred uh, just, uh, you know, not, not, not too long ago. It started beginning back in December. So it starts in December right after the election, right after the election of Obama. So this all sort of stirs up right after that. Hold that thought, hold the thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy's just talking about all the violence over there that's taking place in Iraq, and uh, killing about a hundred Shia Muslims there in Basra, and then the following day, uh, 20 or more uh, Shia Muslims, uh, Sunni Muslims in another community, and basically, of course, because America's gone in there and totally disrupted that government, now, of course, chaos reigns supreme, and uh, our leaders say, oh, shucks, we just thought everything was going to be fine, ladies and gentlemen. They're stirring all these things things up. Basically, of course, we want to create problems. Instead of allowing the Shias to live in one area and the Sunnis to live in the area, we try to force them to live together, and they're certainly if they're not cre creating acts of terrorism, why we can always fund people to carry out these acts of terrorism. Because when you have acts of terrorism, then we can say, well, we really can't pull our troops out. We've got to leave our troops there, and the same thing is true in Afghanistan. Oh, there's still violence there. Well, we're just going to have to stay on. We don't want to stay. We want you to understand that. We want, to, we want to bring our troops home. But after all, we owe it to the people there. We don't owe them anything, ladies and gentlemen. They, they said they had at least a peaceful society. Saddam Hussein, maybe an evil man, we put him in power. We financed Saddam Hussein. We financed him in his war against the Iranians, and we gave him the chemical weapons that he used against the Iranians. I talked to one of these fellows from Special Forces who was assigned to uh, Saddam Hussein's forces to help him use the chemical weapons to kill tens of thousands of, of Iranian boys and children. Of course, then Saddam was smart enough to pack up all those chemical weapons and ship them down to Syria, and that's where they are today. That's what the chemical weapons are that are in Syria, but nobody will tell you that. Where did they came from? They came from the United States. We gave him the chemical weapons. We gave them to Saddam, who shipped them to Syria, and now, of course, they're a threat to that area. Ladies and gentlemen, reality is usually scoffed at. Illusion is usually king. Why do we simply bring our troops home? We, but it's because, of course, the real basis of American foreign policy is to bring about a one-world totalitarian government, which is why we have troops stationed in 130 nations. We have 45 thousand troops permanently stationed in Germany. Why would we have them there 60 years after the war? A 35, over 35,000 troops permanently stationed in, in Japan. Over 25,000 troops permanently stationed in South Korea. Who do you think runs those countries? Do you think it's the people who go to the polls and vote? Or the people who have the weapons, of course, held at the head of the leaders, no matter whether they're from the right or left, 
Why, of course, the people who are occupying those countries, and we are occupying countries all throughout the world, and nobody ever tells the American people. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Go right ahead, Dennis. Yeah, um, so uh, that was what happened about three or so weeks ago in, uh, in May, uh, May 20 and then May 21. But what you, what you have to appreciate is that's just like a, a small part of this, because they originally had these elections scheduled in April, and uh, and there were about six provinces, but they had so much sectarian violence they had to cancel them when I postponed them until the summer. So they'll be coming up again soon. So you know you may have another rash. In fact, uh, in April in that month, over 700 people uh, died in Iraq. Uh, so it's, it's more than just you know a few bombings three weeks ago. Over 700 people died just in the month of April, and that's the, the largest uh, uh, number of people in the past uh, say five years in the last five years, you know, they, so it's not like that That place is all very, very peaceful. Plus, uh, you also have the sort of uh, Sunni-Shia uh, wars uh, between their allies uh, in Lebanon as well it's being stirred up. So you got the Sunni-Shia stirred up in uh, Iraq. you got the Sunni-Shia conflict again in, in Lebanon uh, being stirred up, and so it's sort of surrounding Israel, right? And so you have all of this being stirred up. And the whole objective, as I've pointed out and will point out my theories, uh, will Israel attack Iraq, is it goes back to that, that fundamental statement uh, that uh, Lincoln Bloomfield made uh, to Dean Rusk, Rhodes Scholar, for, uh, when he was Secretary of State uh, under John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy in the early 60s, where he said if the communist dynamic were greatly abated, the West would lose whatever incentive it has for world government. And so all of this is to do the same sort of thing. If the radical Islamic threat were greatly abated, Israel would lose whatever incentive it has for world government. So they used this. This is a, a typical strategy. And now, uh, last time, uh, what I was doing was in the uh, article I have on News with Views. It's a three-part series, uh, and uh, this coming Monday, part four uh, will come up. And part four will be uh, slightly about uh, Israel attacking Iran. It, I mean, it will be about that subject, and it will be part four. But I get a lot into the, the overall goal of the power elite in this whole strategy and concept. So most of Part 4 will be more about the power elite and how it's using uh, this potential conflict between uh, Israel uh, and Iran. Uh, but last week, where we were, was uh, looking at uh, Turkey. Turkey was a, a critical element. And, uh, of course, we, we know about Turkey and uh, how... Uh, Operation Eagle Flight, I had mentioned, which was part of the secret Nazi plan. My latest book is The Power Lead in the Secret Nazi Plan, which is offered by uh, Radio Liberty. I was talking how there were six nations uh, to which uh, Operation Eagle Flight applied. Now, they had various operations, all kinds of operations. But this particular operation was to send their agents, the Nazi agents, uh, around to these various countries, primarily six, or where they would buy up and control corporations, they use stocks and bonds and gold and all that. And one of the key elements in that uh, among those six nations was Turkey. Turkey was very, very important. And so, uh, well, for various reasons, I mean, it's uh, the only nation in that part of the world which is part of NATO. Which means, if uh, you know, if NATO is doing something, then Turkey, because it's a member, would know about it. So right there, you have access by the Turks of whatever we're doing, the Canadians, the British, you know, whatever it is, they will know about it. And so their agents there uh, can relate it to their, you know, terrorist friends. They'll say, okay, guys, here's what NATO's up to. Why? Well, we're a member, so we have we have access. We, we're privy to the, the, to the uh, planning. And so uh, Turkey was very, very important. And as I was pointing out last time, uh, this, whole, uh, this whole central casting bit about certain people the Sunni and the Shia being enemies, uh, you have this largely uh, Sunni population in Turkey, which is allied with the Muslim Brotherhood people in Egypt, and they're supposed to be against the Shia in, the, in Iran. But as I mentioned last time, uh, Paul Williams, who's an author, he's the author of uh, Crescent Moon Rising that came out just this year, and he has said that the CIA for years has known about opium, opium going from Afghanistan poppy fields, where it's now, you know, back to the Taliban has sort of wiped it out, but then we take over and the you know, poppy's back and the opium's back. So, But the CIA had known for many, many years about the opium going from Afghanistan's poppy fields by cargo planes to Iran first and then to Turkey. 
Now, you, you have to be an idiot if you think the Iranians don't know this. I mean, okay, here comes the cargo plane, plop, it's down in Iran, and the Iranians don't know about this, that there's a, a plane landing in Iran, and where it's going on its way to Turkey, their supposed enemy, right? The, the, the Shia are just allowing this cargo plane to land in Iran and then go on to Turkey to the Sunnis, uh, and they're just, okay, sure, it's okay with us. Well, what happens is, as Paul Williams uh, said, a major beneficiary of that transfer of the opium, uh, the poppies opium going from uh, from Afghanistan to Iran to Turkey, has been uh, Fethullah Gulen, G-U-L-E-N, and he was born in Turkey in 1941. He's about 72 years old. But where does he live? In Pennsylvania. Now, he is, he is, he is tremendous wealth, about $30 billion in money, has allowed him to basically control their television, uh, their government, uh, changing it from a basically secular one, military, to one that's predominantly Islamic. Now, you're talking, Dr. Kennedy's talking about what's going on in Turkey. Here's a man with $30 billion. Isn't it interesting? We never mention him. We talk about Bill Gates, and we talk about Warren Buffett. We never mention this fellow, Gulen, who lives in Pennsylvania, who's putting all this money into converting Turkey from a secular society into one controlled by the radical Islamists, by the Muslim Brotherhood. Why don't we ever mention that? Because the media in America is controlled, and the last thing... They want the American people to know is that this whole move towards this radical form of Islam is being funded from right here. But go right ahead, Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Yeah, and it's, it's like the Ayatollah Khomeini in France just plopping himself back into Iran to take over that country. You, you don't control a country from abroad unless you are facilitated by the CIA. Well, basically, of course, that uh, Khomeini was living certainly in 1979 in Paris under the auspices of the CIA, and after we toppled the Shah of Iran, then we installed the Ayatollah Khomeini, and we kept him in power, but you can't let the American people know that, and the phony hostage crisis, and I, we, could, that's a, we could spend hours talking about the people I've personally they talk to, whether it be William H. Sullivan, the American ambassador to to Iran at the time of the initial hostage crisis, or certainly, certainly Gunther Rosbacher, who flew President Bush or Vice President Bush over to negotiate oh, with the Iranians not to release the hostages, but to keep them there until Reagan was actually inaugurated, incidentally. Why, of course, the hostages were released on the very morning of the inauguration, and then, of course, Congressman George Hansen, who had the, uh, t- uh, was foolish enough to go over and negotiate the release of the hostages, so they trumped up charges and put them in prison here in the United States. Why? Because the last thing they wanted was released to the hostages, but you can't let the foolish American people know that. It's it's all smoke and mirrors, ladies and gentlemen, all smoke and mirrors. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and uh, so just like uh, Khomeini, it, it's impossible to control uh, what's going on in Iran from France. Uh, it's impossible for Gulen, sitting in Pennsylvania, to control Turkey unless, once again, it's facilitated by the Central Intelligence Agency. You just you can't be that far away and control the country without the aid of uh, the intelligence services of the home base country, in this case, Pennsylvania, uh, where the, the CIA would be facilitating whatever he's doing over in Turkey. And so uh, the CIA is obviously involved in this. But it's not just Turkey that he's uh, wanting to reshape. He, uh, with our assistance inside this country, has established uh, maybe a 100 or so uh, at least charter schools in the U.S., uh, he brings over Turkish uh, teachers. Uh, they have United States uh, tax funding, supports these schools, uh, as well as his own originally, uh, his original startup money. And so not only does he control uh, a lot of schools in Turkey uh, and the U.S., uh, in instituting a sort of Sharia-based uh, philosophy, but the Caspian area as well, for example, uh, in Turkmenistan uh, as well. And you remember in the Big Nev Brzezinski's book, uh, The Grand Chessboard, how he talked about the can this is 1997, and he talked about the future of control of the Eurozone, uh, and that area of the world was uh, based upon who could control Caspian oil. And so uh, a lot of this has to do with that. In fact, some people say that Afghanistan was all about that. Afghanistan really wasn't about the Taliban so much as 
who would they be able to control that area to have the pipeline come down through Afghanistan, from the Caspian area, down through Afghanistan, uh, further southward to Indian, Southeast Asia, and so forth. So once again, it was all about oil, sort of like the Carlisle Group and what it was doing for Iraq. Well, I think it's so important people have to understand. The reason that they had to take down the Twin Towers and Building 7 and crash a plane into the Pentagon, because it wasn't a plane, because a plane couldn't disappear in an 18-foot hole, or crash the plane in Sanksville, but they didn't crash the plane in Sanksville, because there wasn't any records. They shot the plane down. The, the record was over a, an area of about the, uh, eight miles, but... The American people, you know, they see the hole in the ground, and they tell us the plane crashed there. It doesn't matter. There's no, there's no records there. I mean, you've got to believe your lying eyes. You've got to believe certainly what they tell you, and you better leave, believe what they tell you, or you may end up like so many of the people who've been guests on this program, like Gary Webb. We interviewed him a number of times before he committed suicide by shooting himself in the head twice to make certain he was dead. Go right ahead. Yeah, that's uh, it's like our... Uh our uh, common friend, she's deceased now, Shirley Carell, uh, the town she was in before she was involved with uh, the Florida uh, Forum, Pro Family Forum down there. She published uh, some of my uh, my book, and she said she, was, she told me one day that uh, early on, before she got into that, when she was a young woman, she was a news, uh, newspaper reporter, and the town that they uh, that she was covering was a tourist town, and they didn't want the tourists scared off. Uh, by a lot of murders which were occurring. So she was told every time there was a murder, they, they were so, supposed to make it look like a suicide, right? And so one time uh, she finally had enough of this. <clears throat> and so her report to cover this man who had had his hands tied behind his back and he was, had 18, I think it was, stab wounds in the back. And so she concluded her article by saying, obviously, another suicide. <laughs> so the, the editor fired her when she had enough of that nonsense. Well, but you remember, of course, Shirley, Shirley Carell was supposedly, uh, as I remember, her husband was despondent, so he shot her and shot himself. Uh, and she was well, a great patriot. Well, uh, now actually, uh, that was uh, that was another one. Well, that was another one. Yeah, okay. Shirley, Shirley died uh, also somewhat mysteriously because... She went in for a heart operation. Uh, they used uh, rubber gloves. She was uh, allergic to latex. And then there was only one of three blood thinners that was uh, shellfish based, and that's the one they used. And she was allergic to that too. So that, well, that was. Who, who was the other, who was the other lady who uh, was uh, was killed by her husband supposedly? Yeah, she was uh, in uh, uh, Atlanta. She okay. had her own family group there in Atlanta. She was a senator. She had run for a uh, lieutenant, uh, lieutenant governor. Uh, I used to talk to her sometimes. And in that case, that was a, a strange case, too, because I believe her husband had been depressed. And I, I actually called the newspaper and asked them to check on something, but their reporter who reported on the shooting. The husband <clears throat> uh, supposedly shot her and, and then shot himself. And uh, the children just didn't believe that that was in his nature to do that. Uh, but then uh, I got to wondering. I said, I'll bet. I said to myself, and I asked the reporter if he I left the message to check into this, but I never heard back from it. I bet uh, there are some medications that are supposed to be, you see them advertised on TV, they're supposed to end depression. But in those in those uh, warnings, you know, the side effects are, uh, while the nice music is playing, and you, you know, your depression is ending, but it says, and your kidneys may fail, you know, and your pancreas may fail, and you may have suicidal thoughts, and you may have violent tendencies, and so on and so on. Just like these uh, shooters up at uh, in uh, Connecticut and uh, out in uh, Colorado and uh, what's the name Klebold uh, up at uh, in uh, Columbine, uh, there oftentimes these people who commit these violent acts are on these medications. The side effects are which they you just may cause somebody to commit a violent act, either suicide or violence in general. And so I, you know, I'd be willing to to wager that he was on some sort of medication that made him flip and act in this violent, uh, in this, uh, violent way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that may be what has happened in that situation. Okay, fine. Well, of course, our guest has been Dr. Dennis Cuddy. I understand, ladies and gentlemen, that we live in a very uncertain world. There are powerful forces working behind the scenes. If you haven't read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, you need to get it. You need to get Dr. Dennis Cuddy's book, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. The Power Elite, The Secret Nazi Plan. We carry all of Dr. Cuddy's other books that are in print today. And they are certainly very, very, very revealing. 
We use them regularly for, for reference. So if you uh, want, want to get his books, just call us at 1-800-544-8927. The world is not what it appears to be. Dennis, you have three minutes to wrap up the program. Okay, well, <clears throat> let me quickly uh, add, uh, you had asked who it was. Uh, the, the woman's name was Nancy Schaefer. Nancy Schaefer is the one in uh, Atlanta. Thank you uh, so much. Very, right. very nice woman. Uh, well, anyway, so uh, the point in all of what I've just led up to about Gulen is, uh, you, you might say, well, if all of these people, if Gulen and uh, Osama bin Laden and, and all of these individuals are, uh, you know, I'm Medinejad and Iran are out of central casting, uh, like Gulen out of uh, Turkey, if they're all agents of the Paralite, then why are the Iranian leaders threatening Israel? I mean, you know, why, why would they do that? If the Paralite's in control of everything, well, what's this threat about? And so, as I had mentioned, uh, Lincoln Bloomfield uh, gave the answer to that in the early 60s about the, the radical, you know, the communist dynamic, and so would be the radical Islamic threats will make Israel more willing to compromise, uh, and so that we can enter into this uh, era of uh, world government. And so uh, what you want to do is say uh, the objective is, in, in all of this strategy is this turmoil that they're creating all around Israel, you know, the Sunni Shia stir up in, in Lebanon and Iraq and Egypt and so on and so on. Uh, they're the Sunnis and then the Turks as well uh, being Sunnis against uh, Iran. And then Israel being threatened by Iran, and Iran, you know, wondering what Israel's going to do if it's going to attack them. The objective is to get Israel and every other nation actually to compromise their national sovereignty and to agree to live in peace. You know, you get them worn down, frustrated, maybe conflict, conflict, turmoil within the countries, turmoil between countries. And, of course, <clears throat> this is to get them to accept this world authority, which will be a, a world socialist government. And, of course, the World Socialist Government is supposed to be, initially, it'll be portrayed as benevolent, very much like a W.J. Gintz book, Our Benevolent Feudalism, 1902. Uh, and uh, the nations uh, which attempt to rebel against that system in, at the, that time in, in the future, they'll be considered uh, pariahs and ostracized by the other nations of the world. That's what would happen to Israel, for example. Uh, they would be cut off economically from other nations. And uh, quickly, they would learn about the hardships of the old adage, no man or nations of island. And so they will be told, you must submit to the benevolent will of the world socialist government. Uh, and so, you know, that's the strategy. Uh, that's what they're doing. And uh, anybody who bucks, uh, any individual who bucks that system that they're trying to have us uh, enter into was described also by W.J. Gint in an article called The Next Step, uh, Benevolent Feudalism, which was published April 3rd, 1902 in the Independent uh, Newspaper. And next time we'll pick up with that quote as to how they will handle recalcitrant individuals. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and I hope you enjoy our conversation with Dr. Cuddy. But understand that nothing as it appears to be. Most things are certainly being manipulated from behind the scenes. Well, certainly Joseph Golden from Georgia uh, to remind us that tomorrow is the 48th anniversary of the attack on the USS Liberty. We actually have a 4CD set of the survivors of that attack who were told that if they ever spoke out and told the truth, they would be sent to Leavenworth for the rest of their life or worse. And they realized, of course, that other, or worse, that their officers were meant that they would be killed. And that's really the story of the USS Liberty. They could not let the American people understand that President Johnson wanted to kill all of those men aboard the USS Liberty so he'd have an excuse to go to war with Egypt. We have a 4CD set. We have actually two DVDs, one put out by the BBC, the other put out by a group of, uh, of the survivors of the attack on the USS Liberty. You, you need to understand what this is really all about. The ship would have gone down if the Israeli flyers in their fighter jets had dropped their bombs on the, bo on the boat, but they didn't. They didn't want to sink the USS Liberty, and so they pretended to miss, and they missed. Uh, they dropped their bombs. Sure, they didn't do any damage, and those men survived. But, but the establishment wanted to kill them all. And there were a number of people who were quite willing to go along with it, high up in, ups in the military, carrying out their orders and killing our own servicemen. Uh, call us at 1-800-544-8927. 
1-800-548-9327. We have four interviews with the survivors of the USS Liberty who were told that they would be spend the rest of their life in prison if they ever talked. Well, they did talk eventually 20 or 30 years later. We have it recorded. We have the two DVDs. 1-800-548-927. Now, what about what Dr. Cuddy was talking about, this fellow named Gulen? You've never heard of him, of course, unless you listen to our programs. Uh, he was one of the richest men in the world, who was actually living in Pennsylvania and using his fortune, which, of course, he gets from the CIA, comes from drug running, uh, so that basically they can convert not only... Uh, Turkey, but other countries throughout the Near East and the Middle East into radical Islamic countries because we're creating the best enemy money could buy. This is well covered in a book we carry called Crescent Moon Rising. Crescent Moon Rising. And we hope you want to get that. As well. And you'd like to hope you want to get our, uh, our uh, interviews with Paul Williams. We have a number of interviews with Paul Williams. You need to get them. You need to listen to them. And you need to help us get the truth out. Our telephone number is 1 800 544 And then, of course, you need to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, and some of the other things we have, like, of course, the a four CD set on the New Order of the Barbarians, the four CD set on the Supernatural, uh, the a four CD set of interviews with Constance Cumby, and the DVD of Constance Cumby speaking to our group, who gets into the powerful supernatural forces working behind the scenes that are demonically inspired, that are directing the course of unfolding events. And ladies and gentlemen, some terrible things are about to happen over there. In the Near East, as you know, we've landed a thousand Marines in Jordan. It's not a matter of if, of course, when, but when we get involved over there. And pray for those young men, but pray for the Syrians as well. I mean, basically, and pray for the the, the civilians over there. We've already slaughtered over 80,000 of them. There's no statute of limitation on murder, and when you're financing certainly Islamic radicals, which is what we're doing, why, of course, uh, and we're at war with Iran, incidentally, all these sanctions we're putting on Iran, I certainly are, uh, are certainly have to do with a declaration of war on Iran. Nobody's talking about that. We're moving into terrible, terrible problems. If you haven't got our 4 CD set on the threat of an EMP attack or the DVD and need to get it, again, our number 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Our webpage, RadioLiberty.com. If you're in a position to help us financially, we'd love to hear from you. And if not, please pray for Radio Liberty. Pray for our provision and protection until Monday. May the Lord be with you.